All right, everybody, welcome back to the number one television program in the history of the entire universe. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon, The Blackest Heart, and The Lonesome Crown. All three books published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Today I'm going to be reviewing... <clears throat> Forging of the Dark Sword. This is book number one in the Dark Sword trilogy by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. Came out in 1987 when I was a much younger person. I did read this when it first came out. I'm old. Yes, I, I know. I read this when it first came out because um, I was a huge, huge Dragonlance fan. And of course, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman are known for the Dragonlance novels. This was the first novel that they wrote that was outside of the Dragonlance universe. And when I saw it on the shelf, I was so stoked to get it. It had a Larry Elmore cover. Um, and you know Larry Elmore did the original Dragonlance novel covers. And so I was like, oh my God. Because back then, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman were my favorite writers. Dragonlance was the crowning jewel of all literary achievement, in my opinion. And my gosh, they've come out with something new. So I just immediately bought this and devoured it. Um, in fact, well, I've been collecting Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. I've got all of, that is my entire Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman collection right there. Met, I've met Tracy Hickman several times. I've never met Margaret Weiss, though. And I've met Larry Elmore, the, uh, the cover artist. In fact, if you want to watch my review of my... Uh, I did an uh, interview with Larry Elmore, the artist, last year, and I put that interview up on my YouTube channel. So if you want to watch my interview with the artist, Larry Elmore, just type in Larry Elmore Durfee and it'll come up. Anyway, I've also read and reviewed most of the Dragonlance saga on the channel and uh, I think a, one of the Death Gate novels. But anyway, let's talk about the Dark Sword. Um, we've got the Dark Sword trilogy. Um, I like it. I mean, the spines all look good. They look to good together on the shelf. Each cover is done by um, Larry Elmore. Great colorful paintings with the little color scheme of blue, red, and purple. I like that. So, and, and then on the back, it's got each book has a little sword, the little dark sword. And it's just cool. I like, I like the way that they used to design book covers in the 80s. I just like it. it made me, maybe it's just a nostalgia thing for me. But anyway, great little book cover by Larry Elmore. Um, so, um, what is the Dark Sword about? What is Forging of the Dark Sword all about? Well, I remember when I read this I, as a kid, I, just, I was just blown away by every concept and every wild. Because this is much more concept heavy and big, bold idea heavy than the Dragonlance saga. This is, we're talking about, we're talking about fantasy mixed with space opera science fiction, mixed with um, just pagan ritual and um, just engines and killing machines and sword and sorcery. Everything, it seems like, that Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman could fit in a novel, they fit in this series. Same with their Death Gate. I think I, when I reviewed the Death Gate book, I said the same kind of thing, like, Every idea they've ever had, they're kind of putting them into these books. Um, so the first 80 pages. Now, the, the main story is about this young kid named Joram, who's represented there on the cover with the shirt off. Um, he um, He's the main character throughout the series. He's sort of a, not really a chosen one type, but sort of, but not really. Um, he's, he's raised by his mother, Anja, who is a, abusive and teaches him dark magics and sleight of hand and teaches him that he's um different from everybody else and he can't go play with the other kids out there because he's different he's sort of like rudolph the red-nosed reindeer i mean he can't play in any of the reindeer games he's just excluded um that's the main character but the book starts out with and by the way the book doesn't get interesting until we reach the story of joram the first 80 pages, however, which I'd forgotten from my youth. I remember reading this three or four times as a kid. And, and, and then rereading it now, I remembered I used to always skip the first 80 pages because to me they were nonsense. They're not nonsense. 
Um, that was just me being an impatient kid wanting to read about my favorite character, Joram, and just skipping through the first 80 pages before Joram is even born. Yeah, what happens is in the first 80 pages are about Sarion, the priest, the scholar, the guy that kind of takes Joram as a mentor, sort of the Gandalf, Obi-Wan Kenobi figure of the story. And he is represented here, of course, forging the Dark Sword. At least I think that's it. Yeah, that's him. Um... So the first 80 pages are literally about this guy, Sarion, and how he becomes, um, not Sauron, but sar -yon. How he becomes this scholar, this priest, this person that's going to uh, kind of just do things in this landscape that like a Gandalf Obi-Wan Kenobi figure would type do. Um, and then... Um, and then we meet Joram 80 pages in as just a six-year-old boy. And like I said, he's raised by an abusive person. Um, he's kind of excluded from all the reindeer games. Uh, there are some other characters in this book that I really think are quite interesting. And the interactions they have with um, Joram and Sarion are pretty good. And that's Simpkin, who is a little bit of the comic relief. Uh, Mosiah is sort of Joram's contemporary, his friend, they grow up together, Mosiah. And at this point, when I was a kid, I didn't realize that, um, I read all these Dragonlance novels by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. And, and then I started reading this novel. And I will tell you right up front that there are some, if you, if you've ever grown up Mormon, I grew up Mormon, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Went on a church mission, you know, the two-year mission. I used to be a really good Mormon. Not so much anymore. Don't really go to church anymore. I'm not a churchy guy nowadays. But back then, when I was an active, when I was reading this, I was an active young Mormon. And, there were, and I started noticing in this book that there's a lot of references and a lot of things about Mormonism and Mormon philosophy. Even the character names like Mosiah and Joram, and things like this sort of um, came from Mormonism and the Book of Mormon, and that's the first time I ever put two and two together and thought, is Margaret Weiss or Tracy Hickman a Mormon? Turns out Tracy Hickman's a Mormon lives in Utah. But anyway, I didn't know that back then, but through piecing together the clues that were in this book, nothing about Mormonism is in Dragonlands at all. But I will tell you, there's some Mormon folklore in these books. If you're interested, Mormons might find it interesting. Most everybody else would just think it's like stuff in the book. Okay. So um, there's, like I said, there's uh, one of the things that was interesting about this book to me as a kid is, and, and then, then this is, I guess I probably shouldn't say it because it starts to, it becomes more evidence in book two and then especially book three of the, um, that we're dealing in a landscape of maybe dual realities like kind of like the Elric saga where there's different planes of existence and um, uh, some of them might intersect with our own world. That's all I'm saying. And engines, they call them killing machines in this book, but you find out what they are in later books. Anyway, um, so uh, I did a horseshit job of explaining anything. So I'll just read the back. In the enchanted realm of Merilon, magic is life. Born without magical abilities and denied his birthright, Joram is left for dead. Yet he grows to manhood in a remote country village, hiding his lack of powers only through constant vigilance and ever more skillful sleight of hand. Forced to kill a man in self-defense, Joram can keep his secret from the townspeople no longer. He has no magic, no life. Fleeing to the Outlands, Joram joins the outlawed technologists who practice the long-forbidden arts of science. Here he meets the scholarly catalyst Sarion, who has been sent on a special mission to hunt down a mysterious dead man, and instead finds himself in a battle of wits and power with a renegade warlock of the Dark Duxeroth caste. Together, Joram and Sarion begin their quest toward a greater destiny, a destiny that begins with the discovery of the secret books that will enable them to overthrow the evil usurper Blacklock and forge the powerful, magical, absorbing Dark Sword. 
wow, that, that back description was way better than mine. Anyway, um, nostalgia trip for me rereading this. Um, uh, took me back to my youth back in the 80s, the late 80s, when I first read and reread these a lot. Um, it was a good, good adventure. Uh, I'm not quite as thrilled with these as I was Dragonlance, but still these made an impact on me as a youngster. And so I have to give them credit for that. Uh, rereading them, um, probably not as enthralled with them as an adult as I was as a youngster. Um, uh, but then again, I think in my reread, I caught on to some more adult themes than I ever did as a youngster. Um, so I'm going to give this a solid 7.5 out of 10. And I'm, I've forgotten most of how the story goes. So I'm curious to reread these and see how the story ends up, even though when I was a kid, I knew 